Hi, I'm Bill Patton with 720 Degree Coaching, and it's my distinct pleasure to have Gary Plock on, a man who is a living legend of tennis. And I've known, I've seen Gary's stuff around for a while. I don't think he and I have ever had an extended conversation, but looking forward to getting to know Gary better. And we're going to kind of talk about some old school wisdom about tennis, because Gary's been around the block once or twice. And so... Let's get to know Gary. How are you today, sir? I'm great. How are you doing, Bill? I am doing quite well. So are you currently in Texas? No, I live down in Fort Myers, Florida. I am originally from Kentucky and uh, played some college tennis in Texas and uh, lived there for a while while I had a short stint on the pro tour and uh, (laughs) uh, have been back east for quite a long time now. All right. Very good. So you played at uh, UT? I did. I did. I played four years at UT, uh, all in the number one position. Uh, had a lot of uh, great memories and uh, great teammates like Kevin Curran and Steve Denton and a lot of fellows that went on and made it big in the pros. And so that was a thrill watching them play all the years after I quit playing. That's pretty awesome. And I'll never forget Kevin Curran's quote about the U.S. Open. <laughs> Do you want to you share that one to, for people? Uh, you know, that's that funny. We, we, were, we were up there playing, and uh, I remember I, I lost in the last round of qualifying in a close three-setter to a fellow named Bruce Nichols, who also beat Kevin and I in the finals of the NCAA doubles tournament with uh, his partner, John Austin. And, uh, and Kevin qualified and, and he played a guy named Guy Forget from France. And it was the first year of Flushing Meadows and they were still doing a lot of construction. And I'll never forget watching the match. And there was a guy with a jackhammer kind of on the side and he was, uh, Kevin got a little upset with him. And then after the next day, I think what you're referring to is, he said they should drop an A-bomb on this place. <laughs> it got a little bit of consternation being the South Africa. You know, he's a color, colorful character. And, you know, sometimes it's these guys who have opinions who make life a little more interesting. That's true. That's true. Well, Kevin so, was a great player, went on, did great things. And that was kind of the uh, start of his pro career, which didn't start out too great. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I don't, I don't mind a little outspoken, uh, outspokenness because it, you know, otherwise everybody's just, you know, saying the party line all the time and being super polite. Um, it kind of puts you to sleep for a little bit there. Anyway, so you played the tour for how long? Uh, I just played it for a couple of years off and on and went back to school, got my degree and was assistant coach at the university of Texas. But I will mention about that, Bill, is you're correct, because if you look at the guys like John McEnroe, Howard Cosell, Charles Barkley, it's the guys that really say what they think without regard to what, how it may be politically correct or incorrect that people really want to listen to. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons why tennis had such a more of a viewership back in the day when there were personalities where there aren't quite the same type of personalities as there were then, Jimmy Connors and so on. Well, and I'll go you one step further. The symbiosis between Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell um, created a real dynamo for for all of professional sports. It really, it created a lot more interest in everything because, you know, both of them would play off each other for controversy. So, I'll go, that's let's so put, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Growing, I, ne- growing up yeah. in Louisville, Kentucky, I saw that at a very early age because at six or seven, we were listening to the radio when Sonny Liston and, and Cassius Clay then were, you know, dueling it out at the very start of that career. I, yeah, I remember, I, I'm old enough to remember listening to boxing on the radio. So, that's, <laughs> that's a, that is a bygone era right there. Okay, so, what were some of the things that you learned on the tour that, that you are a good thing to remember now and, and teach the younger generation? Well, you know, uh, 
I, I wasn't like a big pro player and on the tour for that long. What I do remember about the time I was out there uh, was that uh, that it's very tough out there. In those days, there weren't as much money, you know, uh, and there wasn't much money at all. So it was really hard to stay out there on the tour. And But the thing that I remember, because I was uh, – lucky enough to be on the Junior Davis Cup team three different years, once in juniors and then twice on the college advanced Davis Cup, it was called. And we had three different coaches, three different years. And uh, basically it was more of a drive you to the tournament, get you out. And uh, there wasn't training and that type of thing like there is done now. Uh, It was very different. And so I really didn't, you know, and I, I, I took lessons and trained under Harry Hopman. I'd go up to New York when I was 15 and, you know, he may give a tip or two, but uh, basically there wasn't the same level of expertise that there is now. Uh, I had to actually go back and learn it. I studied physiology and kinesiology in college and the 40 years that I've coached it uh, taught tennis, you know, I use more of the physics of teaching rather than, and combine it with the playing because there's really two different elements. You can say all you want about the biomechanics and get somebody to tr- hit the ball right, but uh, within that uh, that area. But uh, you know, playing and winning matches is totally different than that. It's 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 like two different things. Is what I kind of found out from an early age because I was okay. So what's athletic. what's one what's one piece from physics that maybe people don't make enough of a big of deal about? Well, uh, I think the biggest thing is because I've seen on some videos, um, I actually taught Kevin Curran uh, my serve when I was in college that I learned from Roscoe Tanner because I was five foot eight and fairly flat footed and found out early I had to figure out how to get some advantages. So I developed a really good left-handed serve and kick serve. And uh, it's all physics. But I guess one of the main things is that they talk a lot about the uh, upper body on the serve now, but there's a law in physics by Sir Isaac Newton, the third law, that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that is actually the ground where you push your feet into the ground on a serve and come back up and propel your whole body. Then using what's called the contribution of segments, which is the kinetic chain, as they say now. Uh, but without that, uh, that force, for example, the serve is, uh, you know, uh, not nearly as, as powerful. But uh, Okay, so let, let me break in on that for a second then. Okay. So- you remember uh, Vic Braden's contribution on this? You remember him measuring Roscoe Yes, Tanner? I do. Yes, I do. Yeah. I've seen that video. Yeah. So what would? So what's your takeaway from what Vic did? Well, my takeaway is that uh, he's he's just using physics because you use the coefficient a coefficient of friction uh, when you're coming down and up off the court and a lot of things that uh, make power and then. You know, with Roscoe's serve, I forget if he got into this, but there's something called angular momentum, which is the turning of your body and turning of the trunk like a barber pole that creates mm-hmm. what's called centripetal force. And, you know, there's just, it's, it all comes down to physics. You know, why can Justin Thomas hit the ball farther at 170 pounds than these, these big guys, Brooke Kepska? But there's something that he's doing. And, uh, and that's, that's what I figured out is, you know, the guys that really can hit the ball, there's a reason why they can do it. And it's yeah. not like Jimmy Arias, you know, it's not like he was some big brute, but he could kill his forehand. And right. So, so anyway. but, Vic, but Vic measured a certain amount of pressure that Roscoe Tanner was placing on the ground. That's he exactly a pressure plane. right. And I forget, I, in, I don't want to overstate it. I mean, I know it was in the hundreds of pounds of pressure. And I, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought it was 850 pounds or 650, something like that, pounds of pressure that Tanner was putting into the ground that then, you know, powered everything going up. That's right. I don't know what the numbers were either, but I remember that the numbers were just totally different than everybody else's number akin to Nadal, who, you know, it's another uh, 
physics, it's called centripetal, not centrifugal force, but centripetal, mm -hmm. where, where you make a curve towards the axis on the ball, and he does it and generates so much more speed or, or so much more RPMs of the ball turning because that force generated going towards the middle of the ball is just really making it go up and then come down with a lot of speed. But uh, so, you know, that's what I did. I just, when I started teaching my kids, I just started breaking everything down to physics because I said, you know, why can't I, I teach these kids the modern forehand where they're just drilling it. So I had to go back and kind of read everything. And, you know, when I teach tennis now, uh, it's kind of out of Till the match play is the spin of the ball and going magic in an old school. And some of the stuff I think is bunk that he was right about. But one thing that he was right about is that the ball will obey you. And it's a third independent party. You've got you, you've got your opponent, and you've got the ball. And however that ball is going to impact where the ball's going to go, and it obeys you because it comes down to. And I was talking to Renee Richards uh, just the, yeah, two days ago about this, you know, because I said I got this lesson. I want to, you know, teach this person how to really get that approach shot sliced down the line. And he said, teach them side spin to do it, not under spin to slice it. And you know, mm. you've got side spin, top spin, and under spin. Those are the three spins. And anytime you want to put a ball down talking about physics, there's three things that, that dictate whether a ball comes down and I talk about this on the serve, whether it's, you know, there's air pressure, there's gravity, and then there's spin. And those are the three things that affect a, a sphere. And so anyway, um, that comes back to the same thing. You, you talk about physics, but when you teach people, you can't talk in terms of physics because they don't want to hear about that. So if you're saying hit the inside of the ball, it's kind of the same thing. Right. You know, I, I've spent an awful lot of time at the net myself, and, and my game went way up when I started to learn to hit some side spin on my approach shots, because then you, you get the additional angle, you're pulling the ball maybe another foot or two away from somebody. They have to go farther. They're farther off the court to make the approach, sh the, the passing shot. And so you, everything's better with a little side spin on the approach, for sure. Well, you know, it's, it's why the great players always hit on the wall when they were young. All the great players of old. And it's something that you don't see as much, the backboards and the walls being used with younger players now. But, uh, you know, that's where you can learn everything because you, I'm a firm believer that you have to be able to learn to control the ball before you can locate the ball. And then, because uh, I had to figure this out, I wasn't as fast as these other guys, so I had to make them move. And if, you know, the whole key is to control the ball so you can locate it in a place where you make somebody move and you change it up all the time. I had like 14 different serves that I would hit, you know, to different places, different spins, and always be changing it. So there's so much to it when you start talking about strategy versus technique. and the the merging of those two things is, is what's kind of really interesting because you can't really have one without the other, it seems like. Yeah, no, that's great. And so you, you played a very disruptive style. So I break strategy down into five styles. You have the pure power game. You have people who uh, pressure the other person's time and space. You have another person who pressures the other player's movement. You have players who disrupt the other player's rhythm. And that's what I think Nadal is. And then you finally, then you have kind of the retriever grinder types who just run around and hit one more ball. So you, it sounds like, you know, you were always thinking about how to make it a little bit different so that your, your opponent could never really get a beat on the ball. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I got, because I knew this was a situation, I developed a serve where that person had to move every time. And then, talk about physics, I developed a left-handed reverse twist serve, I guess you call it American twist back in the day, by actually taking the 
for me being left-handed, the right side of the ball and pulling across and over it so it would have a sideways kick because a second serve that just kicks straight up has a very predictable course. So that helped me because I could put it into their body. I could put it wide and break in and, and then kick it real wide. You know, I, I think I had one match against McEnroe. I had 16 aces and three of them were second serves. So. Wow. You know, yeah, that, I lost that's awesome. It. Yeah, yeah, but 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 that you're right. You you have you have to disrupt, and you know the more tools you got in your toolbox. If you're just the fifth guy that you're talking about that can sit back there and grind, he can probably beat eighty five percent of the players when he gets real good, like a David Ferrer. But you know he may not ever win Wimbledon because he doesn't have anything else. You know, uh, right, right. See, having different game styles you can play gives you a plan B for when you don't match up well against somebody. You know, I want to go back to spin for a moment because one thing I teach is I is my initial spin that I teach players to do is to hit the ball right about forty five degrees. You know, so if it was the clock and you've got midnight and three o'clock, I tell them to hit it at two thirty. And so then what you get is you get the bottom of the ball spinning at the same speed as the top of the ball. So then you get this, you get this jump, you know, that goes that way. And then, then what you can do is you can go under it a little bit and you get a little more slice and it goes that way, or you can go above it a little bit and now it jumps that way. And so then you have this much more unpredictable, bounce of the ball from just cutting it slightly above and below 45 degrees. Well, that's very interesting that you say that because what you're doing is coming back to what Bill Tilden was saying in, in the twenties. And that is touching a different part of the ball, which is the way I teach people. Now I don't teach them sharp angle by saying, you know, hit, you know, I do teach them by just saying you've got to touch the outside of the ball around that three o'clock or four o'clock underneath a little bit. And, and, and when they, they look at what happens is they end up looking at the ball longer because we know we take our eyes off the ball after a while, but they actually look at it longer because they've got to look at the part of the ball they're hitting, which is basically what you're saying on the serve because you, you gave me three different options of different serves and, but you, referenced really where you're touching the ball by using the clock, which I have done too. It's a great way of doing it because you have to give students something like that they can identify with some kind of visual. Well, and the other thing too, is you can get into some third grade dad jokes. Cause as soon as you start talking about two thirty, then you know, it's time to see the dentist. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. Right. There. Yeah. Two, two thirty. <laughs> 230. 230. 230. <laughs> so anyway. I'm a Kentucky boy. It took me a while. That's good. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, should we get into some statistics and, and sort of the old school, you know, here's how we used to approach kind of the winners, errors, unforced errors. And the thing, the thing, the thing that I want to get into is I actually had an interview with Craig O'Shaughnessy. And then – the co one of the comments on the video was that the, the person said that he thought it wasn't a smart idea to combine unforced errors and forced errors into one statistic. But my counterpoint was the same as Craig's, that there's so much subjectivity that comes into that. How do we break it down so that, you know, we teach players you know, some errors are inside your control and some are not. What, how, where's the dividing line? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, you know, because as you, I guess, I guess what, what was he saying? Was he saying that because you, you don't want to just, just get the ball in all the time, you got to go for some shots? Well, so no, what, what Craig was saying was that when he gets – stats that the are, are the so-called official stats of a turn of a of a match that sometimes the stats are done by somebody who's a fan of the player 
And sometimes um, the person doing stats gets distracted. Oh, it's subjective. And, yes. and it's so subjective. And, and so, wait, well, was that an unforced error? Was a forced error? Well, this person doing the stats has really high standards for, for how people should play. So more things are called unforced errors. So, you know, and so he did this test and he, he showed 10 consecutive points and he had people guess whether it was going to be called an unforced error or an error. And <clears throat> by the end of six points being played, everybody was sitting down because they had all guessed wrong what the official stat would be. And this is in a room of like 150 people. So, so the subjectivity is a problem, but then how do we as coaches manage that with our players? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's similar to the guy that's doing the assist right on a, on a basketball game. Is that an assist or was it not an assist? Things like that. So, and, you know, the guy that's doing the, the charting, does he know, has he ever hit a low slice that's going slow? And maybe that's a little tougher shot than a, than a ball with pace on it that's up in the strike zone more. So, I, yeah, I can, I can see how that would be uh, misleading to, to a, a student to, to know, you know, what he's supposed to do. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I haven't, you know, I, I haven't, uh, I'm not a statistic guy as, as, as much as other people probably that are better coaches than me because as a player and a player from the old time when you, you weren't involved with reading stats and what, you know, I know some people charted matches, but it didn't happen very often. So I guess that's why I'm a dinosaur. Those guys that break it all down, um, you know, I, it's, it's interesting, but um, don't know what to say about that, Bill. Okay. So, I mean, so let's, but let's go back to, you know, when you played a match and you, I mean, there, there had to have been times you realized, that you made too many errors or, or that, you know, you were aggressive, but maybe you were overly aggressive. Um, and I mean, so how do you, how do you manage, how did you manage that? What's sort of the first bit of like old school advice that, that covers this topic? Well, you know, and this might not answer the question on, on statistics of percentage tennis, but, when I would go into a match, first of all, I wanted to know who I was playing, how they played, what court we were playing on. Because as you know, if you're playing clay or you're playing, as we did in college, we played, you know, mostly on fast courts where if you had a serve and a volley, there was no reason to do anything else. Uh, <laughs> if you had a really good serve, you, you know, I would try to play for a break and each set and try to hold serve every time on a fast court. Now, you know, I was also – a uh, semifinalist in the national junior clays in the 18s because I grew up in Louisville on the clay and that's where the tournament was. So had to run there and it was totally different. You know, you've got a, on a slower surface, you've got to keep a person deep unless they're heavy top spin and you can in your arsenal put something short and low or, or wide on them to make a move or to make a miss. So my statistics in my head was to take inventory of how somebody played and then what can I do with what I could do because I didn't have very good forehand. I couldn't drive it because I had total continental grip on everything back in that day. And so uh, anyway, uh, that's what I would do. I would, I would try to see how I could break the guy down. And if it was, if I thought I was more consistent than him, I'd slow it down, play deep, and wait for him to miss and make him move. If it was on a fast court, I would just play aggressive tennis and, uh, and try to hold serve. So everybody's different because everybody's got a different type of game. But I was fortunate enough that I could vary my game a little bit. And I think I was thinking statistics because, you know, you always, you know, try to hit it cross court when you've got a guy pinned. And, but it's something intuitively that I think I learned over the time of just playing matches. No, I think that's, I think that's a really good answer. It's a really good answer because it speaks to kind of the trend, the, the evolution of mindset of how to play. And there's still people to this day who say, 
at you know damn the torpedoes and and they're ready to ram you know into the other ship so i mean because i know that there there are some very prominent coaches who could care less about any of the statistical analysis of any of the matches going on and they want their player to play on feel um i don't necessarily agree with that but People have been very successful playing like that, so it's hard to argue with. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I, what, what do you mean by what do they? What do they mean by they say play by feel, by feel out the other guy, or the yeah, way they're yeah, playing? sort of feeling out, the, you know, and then I mean, or or kind of the the notion of just play your game, right? Impose your game on the other player. And, and there's some people who just out and out think that anybody dealing with data analysis in matches is practicing tennis malpractice. It's, you know, and, the, and they ought to lose their license or something like that because they just don't see any validity to trying to win points, you know, in short order. They think that that leads to sort of an over-aggressive approach to the game. Uh, so that brings into play the strategy of people that coach for serve and first strike, for example, with the big guys. But then you see at the top level where the points go on a long time, don't you? Well, do they? Because the data seems to suggest that that with men's tennis, about 70% of the points are over before the fourth shot is made. And with women, it's 65% of the points are made, are, are won or lost before the fourth shot is made. So, or fifth shot, I'm sorry, the fifth shot, both of those. So, you know, most, most points are won within four shots. Well, see, that's where that's where I'm data shy. That's that's really interesting, and I think I've I've heard that stat before, and I should probably be a little more in tune with that uh, type because I did not know that was the case. You know, I'm thinking of these these finals where I'm seeing the guys play some longer points, but uh, that's that's very interesting. So that would really say that uh, kind of uh, why they trying to coach a big serve and a big forehand right off the bat, isn't it? Yes. Well, and one thing that you've seen, especially with Nadal, is the transition towards Nadal playing much shorter points as he gets older. He, he you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say he's lost a step, but he's not going to get faster. And he might have lost a half a step, but he knows that he's got to finish points off quicker than he did before. Um, so, all right. So, we could probably ha handle one more topic is there's one other little piece of wisdom that you would like to share before we wrap this thing up. Ah, uh, boy, let's see one more piece of wisdom. Do, are you, is your audience talking about people that are pro on this pro level and training? Or are you talking about junior players? Just playing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pro. mostly yeah, it's mostly high level stuff. But I mean, we can get into you know how to get people to the four or five level at the club. Um, you know, I think that that's or you know even general wisdom for turning people into players faster. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I I think that uh, probably the. Uh, the most important thing that I can think of is, is how, how, you know, so many players are similar in at this high level in terms of their technique. They seem to all have big forehands. There's a lot of big serves, you know, and guys that do have, uh, I, well, I guess it's, it's more of a backcourt game than it was in my day a lot when you were playing on the hard courts. Uh, so because of the rackets, as we know, and everything and the strings that have changed things, but, on a big point, you know, it's the guys that win the big points that win the matches. It still is. And the one thing that I learned that helped me, because I was real competitive, real high strung, type A, but when I learned on the big points, when I was hitting the ball or thinking about what to do to not choke, because we all choke, 
is is to breathe is to be able to learn to breathe out and exhale when I was hitting the ball. So it really doesn't have to do with strategy and stats as much. It's just the feeling of how do you feel when you're hitting that ball? Because from a physiological standpoint, if you thinking about it and you're tight, where am I going to go with this ball? Where's the stat say I should hit this ball instead of free swinging it and instinctively knowing what to do it, do and breathe out and exhale. If you don't do that, if you're inhaling, your muscles are tight. And I think that's yeah. why people choke from a physiological standpoint. How do you yes, do yes. that? You know, so there's actually, yeah, let me break in for a second. All there's, right. So yeah, I mean, so when you exhale, and people could try this at home, do, do like a pretend curl while you're exhaling, and then do the same thing while you're inhaling, and you'll feel the difference in your arms. You know, so when you exhale, your muscles elongate, and when you inhale, your muscles contract. So another interesting thing, there was some research done about 20 years ago, maybe more, that if you're exhaling when you hit, you can gain anywhere from 5 to 10% more power on your shots on the serve. And on ground strokes, 3 to 5% more speed on your ground strokes if you're exhaling as opposed to inhaling. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think the physiological reason for that is, is because when you're inhaling and you're tight, your muscles do contract, but also your antagonistic muscles, the ones that are opposite, like if you're really, you know, going up on a serve and you're using your thighs, if you're tight, you'll feel hamstrings actually tighten up too. And it, com it causes what we call in Kentucky, Kentucky a, uh, what do we call that? A conundrum, but anyway, uh, when I when I learned to Kentucky's let it go, got its own like, special language. That's awesome. That's right. A conundrum. That's right. A conundrum. That's right. But uh, when you can, if you, because it's tough. I mean, I, I mean, I, I played McEnroe in front of five thousand people one time in our basketball court at the University of Texas, and uh, you got five thousand people up there, and they're all rooting for you. It's, it's tough to get loose, you know, and I had, I had to practice that and it didn't work too well that day, but I tried. Yeah, that's, you know, I mean, definitely as the stakes go up, it's more important to get your breathing in for sure. All right. So let's, let's bring it home. What are, um, you know, two or three takeaways from this time that you want to, that you want to drive home? I think I think the main thing. I don't care if you're a pro or whatever it is. You've got to you you've got to always hit balls. You can't take too much time off, or it just takes too long to get back. If you can hit on a wall, it's it's great. And I'm maybe not for the top players. You're not going to do that. But if you can find a wall to where you can gain control of the ball first, and then learn to watch the side of the ball, like you're talking about on that serve, and actually make contact with it. Breathe out, try to inhale, and then exhale when you hit. Like you say, it frees you up. And, uh, uh, and, and then just, just anticipation is probably the biggest thing we haven't talked about. You know, that if you're not as quick as Johan Creek, then, you know, you've got to watch that ball, see where it's going, and anticipate what not only when to go, but where to go. The one thing that I tell my people and, and about anticipation is that if you move soon and you move somewhere, you get your body in motion, which is Newton's other law, one of his other laws of body in motion, but uh, you get moving, even if it's not the right way, you can get there faster. So that's how you anticipate is get off your heels, watch the ball and move right off the guy's racket to get in the best position so you can have the advantage. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, Gary, it was great to get to know you a little bit. And uh, thanks for the stories. And thanks for the, the old school tennis wisdom. And I'll look forward to seeing you online. Thank you, William. <laughs> no, nobody calls me William, but I'll let you do that. That's good. That's I appreciate that. Have a have a great day, sir. Welcome.